My name is Sophia Schur, and on behalf of the League of Ukrainian Catholics, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our spiritual retreat, The View from the Cross. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to His Grace, Metropolitan Archbishop Boris Budyak, um, from the uh, Arch Eparchy of uh, Philadelphia, um, Most Reverend Bishop Paul Chomnitsky from the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Stamford, Connecticut, His Excellency, uh, His Excellency Most Reverend Bishop uh, Benedict, Benedict Alexeychuk of St. Nicholas, Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of uh, um, Chicago, and uh, His Excellency Most Reverend Bishop of Dan Danilo of St. Joseph that Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Parma, and to our dear National Board Spiritual Director, Father uh, Reverend uh, Father um, uh, Archpriest Mariam Protzik from St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Church in Buffalo, New York. So we're pleased to have almost 200 registrants uh, for today's um, uh, retreat. Uh, from all over the United States. Uh, we're also thrilled to welcome friends from Canada, as well as from Wroclaw, Poland. Uh, as you may already see, our uh, registrants include a good mix of uh, clergy, uh, sisters, and, uh, and lay people. I'd like to thank Father Deacon uh, Nicholas Modelski from God With Us Online, and Steve Cunningham from Census Fidelium, for helping us extend our reach, enabling us to share this program with a broader audience. So my thank you uh, to you both for that. Uh, we began doing uh, online spiritual retreats in 2020 in response to the pandemic, and we continue with them as they unify us uh, uh, like-minded Christians throughout the US, Canada, and indeed the world. Not only are we enjoying this spiritual unity with each other, we also have what is otherwise a rare privilege of having four bishops together at one time to guide us how very fortunate we are. Thank you, bishops. Um, a quick note uh, before we begin, there's a slight change in the timing of the presentation. Um, uh, Bishop Benedict will uh, join us via pre-recorded video. Uh, which is in Ukrainian. So if you don't understand Ukrainian, just bear with us. It's a short video. It then will be followed by a video in English. Uh, so our spiritual journey through Lent usually leads us to examine our own lives through bearing witness to the weeks, days, and hours leading to the crucifixion. Flooded with the emotions of grief and profound sadness, we find ourselves at the foot of the cross looking up to our Lord who is dying before our very eyes. Through this retreat, however, we offer you an alternate perspective. Instead of finding ourselves at the foot of the cross looking up, we place ourselves on the cross with Christ to feel the wood and the weight of the cross on our beaten body, to feel the nails in our hands, the same hands that healed the sick, the blind and the crippled to endure mockery and humiliation, and to look at those who watch our agonizing death, those who, who persecute and condemn us. Can we, looking out from the cross, find mercy? Can we forgive? Can we love? For these are the treasures we seek in our journey today. And now, without any further delay, it bring, brings me great pleasure to introduce uh, the League of Ukrainian Catholics National Spiritual Director, the very Reverend Archpriest, Father Mariam Protsik. Father Protsik. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord and Master of my life, take away from me the will to be lazy and to be sad, the desire to get ahead of other people, to boast and brag. Give me instead a pure and humble spirit, the will to be patient with other people and to love them. Let me realize my own mistakes and keep me from judging the things other people do, 
for you are blessed now and forever and ever. Amen. Today we come together to reflect on Christ's viewpoint from the cross, the words he spoke, the suffering he endured, the hardships he faced, and the symbols of his victory over death. The immense love he poured out to humanity even during his crucifixion. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, he spoke a few words that we should always meditate upon. There is a special phrase that at first glance may appear as a cry of desperation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? It is the beginning of Psalm 21, and not some revolt against our Heavenly Father. This prophetic psalm describes accurately the situation in which Christ is finding himself on Good Friday. The Lord continues, My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I have no relief. All who see me, mock me. We have all experienced certain levels of hardship in our own life. Perhaps we have suffered the loss of loved ones, been confronted by a sudden illness, or required painful treatments for some long-term ailment. Maybe we faced unemployment or some other financial struggles, experienced what felt like a series of setbacks, or fell upon hard times that left us feeling hopeless. This becomes the cross we bear, yet we are only able to carry this cross because of our immense faith in Jesus Christ, who took up his cross for each of us, and who is sending us to help carry the crosses of others, as well as sending others to help us carry our crosses. We can certainly identify by varying degrees with the situation described in Psalm 21. But today I would like to reflect on the situation that Ukraine is facing, the hardship that she must continue to endure. Ukraine is under attack. And so we turn to God with a similar question, why? Why this unjust war? Why this senseless bloodshed? Where are you when we need you the most? Already two years, and there seems no end in sight. The great suffering continues day and night, and many mock us, calling us unworthy of freedom and peace, maintaining that we are Nazis who have no right to exist and have to be exterminated. Christ continues to pray this psalm, and in verse 11 he says, Do not stay far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Let us always pray with all who suffer. Let us be on their side, and let us help them in any way we are able to. Lord, do not be far from us. Provide help for us. Send your holy angels to guide us. Bring us good allies who will not cease to be by our side until the victory, and the victory will certainly be ours at appointed time. Jesus continues to pray with the words from this psalm, Many bulls surround me, fierce bulls of Bashan encircle me, a pack of evildoers closes in on me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They divided my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. Let us go back to our prayer for Ukraine. There are many Bashan bulls who encircle us, or should I say Russian bulls, who constantly charge at us, who do not have any regards for human life, neither for our lives nor the lives of their own people. They try to destroy everything. They inflict wounds on the defenseless, and they take what is not theirs and burn the rest. 
Let us remember Butsha, Irpin, Mariupol, Borodyan, Kaizum, and many other cities and villages annihilated. Christ continues to pray, but you, Lord, do not stay far off. My strength, come quickly to help me. Save me from the lion's mouth, my poor life from the horns of wild bulls. Patriarch Shatoslav recently said, Ukraine is wounded but unconquered. Ukraine is exhausted, but it is standing and will stand. No one in Ukraine thinks of giving up. And it is so because God is on our side. He is giving us strength. He is saving us from our enemies, from the wild bulls, and we believe that the end of war is coming soon. At the end of this psalm prayer on the cross, Christ concludes, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the assembly I will praise you. The generation to come will be told of the Lord that they may proclaim to a people yet unborn the deliverance you have brought. We also will continue to pray to God and praise the Almighty because the view from the cross changes everything. Christ looks out and sees all injustices and sides with all those who are suffering with him from the beginning to the end of the world. And it is his vision for the solution, the best one only he can provide. And yes, he also sees Ukraine and the suffering she has endured and continues to overcome. Christ's vision from the cross helps to keep us connected to him and one another today, tomorrow, and always. We are so blessed to have our bishops here with us today to reflect on Christ's view from the cross, the suffering he endured, the healing grace of his hands, and how his victory leads to our salvation. We remember that Christ suffered and we suffer, but Christ resurrected and so will we. God bless us all. God bless Ukraine. Thank you each and every one for your prayers. Thank you. Okay, it is finished. Thank you, Thank you Father Marian. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to Metropolitan Archbishop Boris Gudiak, who will lead us on a, a historical, cultural, and spiritual perspective of a death by crucifix. Um, Archbishop. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Isusu Christu. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Sophia, in the League, and Father Marian for this invitation to all of us. Uh, but to us bishops particularly. Um, we live in a time when not everybody, you know, wants to listen to a bishop or be with a bishop. Uh, I guess Jesus was also not always, uh, you know, kind of listened to. Uh, so I just want to say I very much appreciate all of you being here, fathers, um, our reverend sisters, uh, our sisters, uh, servants, uh, Brazilian sisters, and all of you uh, members of the church. Uh, you are all people who have dedicated your lives to, to the Lord. And uh, I think all of us, the four of us bishops, want to encourage you and um, share with you this, this afternoon on the eve of the beginning of Holy Week, on this Kritna uh, Nedila, Palm Sunday, which is also the eve of the Feast of the Annunciation, uh, a great feast when even during Holy Week, even during Great Friday, we have a divine liturgy, uh, which the feast is even greater than the mournfulness of, of uh, Lent and Holy Week. And uh, on a day when we kind of begin 
to move very closely, very intimately to the passion of our Lord, which has at its center the cross. Allow me to share with you something that is uh, very personal. Many great saints and many of us um, minor sinners, we have moments or periods in our lives when we have doubts about the faith. When we doubt our vocations, we might doubt our position in a marriage, we might doubt our job. Um, and in the midst of a world that often is aggressively agnostic, if not atheist, um, in a culture that is quick to ridicule the church, belief, prayer, piety, chastity, obedience, poverty, uh, we can sometimes be wondering, do I really believe? And of course, the deeper answer is not a question of, do we believe in God? But the real answer is that God believes in us. And for me, what we have before us this week in celebrating the passion of our and resurrection of our Lord is an overwhelmingly powerful and convincing argument, if you will. Uh, it, it is something that no, no person could have invented. Uh, it's something that uh, really is divine. And it has at its center a great paradox. It has the cross. Historically, the cross was something very degrading. And we who wear the cross on our chests, who make the sign of the cross on our bodies, who have the cross in our rooms atop our churches, we can no longer fully imagine uh, how, how devastating the symbol of the cross was at the time of Jesus. The cross, crucifixion, was meant to be the most degrading thing that could be inflicted on a human being. It's something that kills it's an instrument of death. But in its, it's an instrument of death that means to degrade, to ridicule, uh, to look at with great irony and disdain. It's designed to make the victim suffer, for that suffering to then be visible. It's on, that suffering is on a pedestal. And that suffering is meant to demean the person, but also to frighten others. Drive home that the authorities that crucify can do it to you. And it will be done to you if you act like this criminal. Uh, the crucifixion, historically, was something that was practiced for about a thousand years, from the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD in the Mediterranean basin. There is the earliest known reference to something analogous to impalement is in the Code of Hammurabi, dating from 1700 BC. Impalement 
which was used back then in Mesopotamia, the kind of placing on a sharpened stake of a human being, of piercing through the back end of uh, the entrails, uh, was something that continued to be used not only 1,700 years before Christ, but 1,700 years after Christ. The Turks would impale our Ukrainian Cossacks. There is, of course, uh, the famous and legendary Vlad the Impaler in Transylvania. Uh, with what is now Romanian territory. But impaling was a rather quick death, very painful, but not long-lasting in its process. The crucifixion, on the other hand, was something that extended the agony in order to make the degradation a long process to be endured by the victim, but also to be contemplated by all passers-by. Sometimes uh, there was just one stake to which uh, the condemned person was affixed by ropes, or later by nails, eventually it developed into the cruciform um, instrument that we know uh, from the Gospels. If, as originally used, the person was just nailed or tied to the stake or to the cross, the death would actually come quicker because the person would be asphyxiated. The person could not breathe. Uh, the condemned would suffocate. And so to make the suffering last longer, a seat was installed of some sort. And the legs were supported. Uh, if there was reason to end the suffering or end the life to kill the person. Uh, as we know from the Gospels, uh, the legs could be broken or even the lungs or heart could be pierced. Uh, almost always, particularly in Roman times, before the crucifixion, the condemned person was flogged. The flogging occurred when the person was stripped, and often the person uh, remained stripped as they were forced to carry their cross to the ultimate place of crucifixion. In Among the Jews in Israel, uh, those who were led to be crucified, were allowed to put some clothing on. And we know well the narrative describing in detail the different aspects of Jesus' execution. What is it in the crucifixion of our Lord that that this speaks particularly to me. Why do I say that it is a very important argument for me in my moments of doubt and questioning? I think it is because of the profound mystery that appears before our eyes not only through the narrative of the passion in the crucifixion itself, but in the whole history of salvation. 
Today, science expands our knowledge. We know increasingly more about the universe, about the laws of nature, about biology, about how our bodies work, how diseases destroy, how medicine can cure. In other words, in one sense, we know more about our life and our death and about the world in which we live and die. But ultimately, there is the great mystery. Where did it all begin? And where to where is it leading? For me, that is the beauty, the convincing power of our faith. This manner in which through God's love we are created we are created in a universe you know scientists tell us it's like 40 billion light years in radius we can't even fathom that how far light goes in 40 billion years that's in one direction uh, and all of this is in the hand of the Pantokrator, the holder of all, our creator. And God creates all of that and creates every one of us and counts the hair on every head. A few of us give God, you know, a, a smaller task. Uh, but the proposition of our faith is that each and every human being is a beloved daughter or son of God, a child of God. And that love is something we have turned away from. We make conscious decisions, sometimes some conscious ones combined, to turn away from that love to separate ourselves. But we do that in a way that leads us down a path of death. Because when we turn away from the source of life, we wither and ultimately die. And that is the explanation of the suffering that we endure. We cause suffering, but we also bring it on to ourselves. And no amount of words, no amount of messages, no amount number of prophets or angels was enough. It was necessary for the Lord to come, to come into this world, to enter our life, to live it, to grow as a human being from childhood through adolescence to adulthood, to cry, to be hungry, to endure heat and sweat, to labor, and then fully to enter the death caused by our sin. I think if most of us were making up a God or trying to imagine the Lord, you can't hear me very well? I'm sorry. Is there a problem hearing me? Uh, the, the volume did go down a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I'll continue. I have been hearing you all along. Okay, because uh, somebody walked up me to me and said, you can't hear me. Uh, so if we were to, you know, be tasked with kind of describing God, I think most human beings would describe somebody with great power. 
And that is understandable. But I don't think we could describe a God that for his creatures humiliates himself, allows himself to be humiliated. A God that regarding his creatures puts himself into the creature's hands. And not simply into their hands, but into their mindset of illusory power. The Romans, the Persians, others who practiced this crucifixion imagined that they demonstrated their power to those who were condemned to the victims of this capital punishment. The Lord, Jesus, puts himself into the hands of his creatures and experiences utter humiliation. He does not hang on to his divinity, but descends, goes down as low as possible, enduring the fruits, the bitter fruits of sin, although he never sinned. The innocent lamb allows himself to be sacrificed. So as to enter into that place that is our dread, that is our demise. And when the source of life enters death, as we pray in the liturgy of St. Basil, Death cannot survive. This is not a linear logic that addresses my doubts and my vacillations in faith. It is an act of illogic, an act that is beyond our, our, our imagination and our uh, reasoning. It is a love that is greater than what we can think up or imagine. There are all the technical sides of the cross. And I encourage you to read it. You can find, uh, even in Wikipedia, information about how it occurred. You can watch uh, Mel Gibson's film, which is hard to watch without turning away, because indeed we cannot really accept the fact that this kind of suffering is doled out. But it is, as Father Marian explained, that Ukrainians are being crucified and Israelis were killed by Hamas, and people are being killed, innocent people in Gaza. And all over the world, there's 20 wars where, where we, we are killing each other. But in the crucifixion, we have something unique. It's not just a human being that is being killed. It is God-man. It is God who has all the power, the holder of all, the holder of the universe, the Pantocrator, who willingly allows himself to be humiliated. And it is that humility of Jesus on the cross that is most powerful, is the most powerful expression for me. The humility of him who is life, who accepts the worst kind of death. A death on the cross. A death that we will see this week. A death to which Jesus goes in its most utter de depths. So as to rise from there and give life enter that death, and rip apart its shackles. We will sing, 
Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death by death, trampling our sin and our death by that utter humiliation on the cross. And going down into Hades, then giving life to those in the tombs. All of us have some kind of tomb in our hearts and our souls. Let us allow Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior, the Son of God, to come in those places. And let us embrace our cross, our humiliations from which we normally flee, which we consider great injustice. Let us see our humiliations as a place that can be close to the cross. A token of the suffering of Jesus. And let us embrace that humility. Because in that humility, we will be intimate with the Lord who saves through humility. That for me, brothers and sisters, is the incredible, unique, sacramental, and mystical power of the message of the cross. And thank you for this opportunity to share this with you.